introduction was to begin where the gospel of John ended. You know, many more things could have been written than what has been in this gospel, but these are written that you may believe. Well, many books and volumes could be written about Gene's life because he's done so much and made may, may, many uh, publications, but it's been just a delight to have him say, you know, show us when we go up to Door County, well, you know, part of this climate change is the, the lake here has risen. Oh, good. Okay, it's ready. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, anyway, the, but here you go, Jim. I'm gonna get up. It's caused all this confusion, so. Anyway, uh, let's see, I'll put this in presentation mode. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah. So, all right. So, so can I advance it or do you advance it? Okay. All right. So, um, so here's what we're going to uh, talk about today. Well, first of all, I appreciate being invited here. My first visit to, to Madison was 1984. I came for a meeting at the atmospheric science program at the university. By the way, that's a very, very distinguished program. Some of you uh, may remember the name Werner Sumi. If you don't, uh, you should. He was the father of the weather satellites. It all started here. Uh, the meeting I was here for was to extend the this into the teaching mode, and so I um, this this place has been a special to me because it was very important in the early part of my career, being coming over from physics to meteorology. I had to learn about meteorology because I didn't have any courses, never had a course in meteorology, and I've found a career here. But anyway, so uh, I know that there are people here that. Uh, may be very well versed in, in some of the ideas of climate that are that are being done here at the university. And so I feel sort of like a long tailed tomcat in a room full of rocking chairs to think about, you know, that you may know more about some of these things than I do. So anyway, uh, I will uh, and I had to go through this, make sure I had everything referenced and everything because I know there are going to be some good critics here. So we're going to talk about uh, climate change. Is it real? How do we know just briefly? Uh, we'll look at some of the scenarios of where, where we are now in terms of our climate and where we're going in terms of our climate. What will it look like by mid-century, uh, end of century? And then uh, some scenarios of, I, of Wisconsin's future climate. I have a, a stake in this also because of our little place up in Door County. So, uh, and that was the photo that you've been looking at while we've been searching for this. And then finally, we'll end up with taking action. What can we do as a society? And what can we do in, as individuals? So, oh, there it worked. Oh, it worked on mine, but not yours. Okay, next slide. Uh, maybe. So, uh, Oh, here we go. All right. So uh, this is really pretty small now. So let me just let me just give you an overview. This is a plot from that goes from 1880 up until the present 2020. This one goes only till 2018, but uh, it's the same as we extend it out. So and this is the temperature of the earth. This is uh, degrees Celsius or here we go. Well, good. This is degrees Fahrenheit. So we're talking about a degree Fahrenheit is this amount here. So uh, the earth's average temperature it went down through a period uh, in the early 20th century and then but since about the 1960s these temperature these bars show that the temperature has just gone unrelentingly up and that there are wiggles on that chart uh, but we know why these wiggles are occurring these are el nino events these uh, high spots and the low spots here are due to some of them are La Nina. These are the the uh, uh, flow patterns or the ocean temperature patterns in the tropical Pacific that are so large they have an influence on the global uh, uh, climate, the global temperatures at that period of time. And but there are others like volcanoes. And when a volcano goes off here, at Mount Aegung in 1963. 
El Chichon in 1983 and Mount Pinatubo in 1991. That cools the climate by about a half a degree or, or less. Uh, and then uh, because of all the haze that's in our atmosphere and that reflects more energy. And so it allows the planet to cool. And so, but after a period of a, of a few years, it, re, it returns back to this, this underlying trend, which is caused by greenhouse gases. Now, greenhouse gases, the main one is our carbon dioxide, also methane and nitrous oxide are the most prominent ones. And these are due to uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions from our burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Um, methane is a decay of plant matter, uh, but also from uh, animal agriculture and our use of nitrate fertilizers that creates nitrous oxide. It's a very durable gas. It gets in our atmosphere and can, cannot be destroyed until it's uh, broken up by um, ozone or, or by ultraviolet light in the stratosphere. So uh, next slide. Uh, by the, uh, I just put this out. I just heard about this uh, this past week. A friend and colleague of mine, Lou Zisco, who's at Columbia University, has just published a book. It was just released uh, last month uh, on the greenhouse planet. And, and he's a very noted biologist. Uh, and this is uh, what it's about. So if you're interested in looking at, at uh, carbon dioxide and what it, uh, what it does to our planet, uh, you should uh, take a look at this book. Next slide. Uh, so if we take that first graph and we compress that into uh, uh, just a short period. So here's the, from, uh, well, from, this is from 1850. And so you, you can see that, uh, the, again, that the shows the temperature going up. But if we put this in a longer context back to uh, the time of Christ, and this is the present. And by looking at tree rings and lake sediments, we can reconstruct by what we call proxy methods. We can reconstruct the climate. And this again is temperature. And you can see here, this 19, uh, 1850 to 2000, or 2020 is compressed into this very uh, small period here. But you can see that in the whole ske scheme of two, last 2000 years, this is totally anomalous. That is not natural. There is no physical process that can make our global climate change that much in such a short period of time. It's not El Nino, it's not volcanoes, it's not some sort of cycles over that period of time. Now, if we look at a longer period, 100,000 years, we found that, oh yes, there, there are cycles. Or if we look at a million years, we can see that there are about uh, 10 of these 100,000 year cycles because of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. But in terms of human time scales, we have to deal with what's happening here because it's not natural, it's due to humans. Next slide. So, uh oh, <laughs> there we go. Whew. All right, so let's, let's zero in on the US now. Let's just look at the, that the uh, current era. So here we're looking at the difference between the most recent 30 years and the uh, uh, 20th, early 20th century. And we see that, uh, and this is temperature now, this is one and a half degrees, the dark red is about a degree and a half, is how much the earth has, uh, the US has warmed. And you see that it's been warming quite uh, markedly in the West and some places in the Northern latitudes. But there's this hole, we gave a name to this, which is stuck in the scientific literature, we call it the warming hole. Um, and, and in fact, in, over this part, it's actually a cooling, but in some places in the future, if we look in the future, we see that everything is warming, but there are holes in the warming where it's warming less. And that name warming hole is one enduring contribution that our team has made to this uh, literature. But anyway, uh, uh oh. Hmm. So, okay, so let's just go to the, 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 on the previous one, there was the you, um, uh, winter and, and summer. Uh, the winter temperatures you see have warmed more uh, than the summer temperatures. And in fact, this cooling or this lack of warming or the warming hole is really uh, pretty much due to the fact that the summers 
have not warmed. And that's true in, in Wisconsin here too. I can show that in one of the future slides. And that's due to the excessive rainfall that we've had in the Midwest and Wisconsin is a part of that as well. Let's go to the next slide. So, uh, and so the coldest temperatures of the year uh, have, have become less cold. In other words, there's been a warming on the cold temperatures. And you can see that in this area, is, that's, that's happened. So our, our winters aren't as brutal as they used to be. Those of us of a certain age, you know that uh, we don't have those extended periods of minus 20 that we used to back in the day, you know, when we had to walk to school every day uh, uh, across the prairies. Um, and but the, and the warmest temperatures of the year have actually cooled, so we don't have those hundred degree days as many. In Ames and in, in Iowa, uh, we have had uh, only like two or three days a year above a hundred. We've had years where we've had twenty days above a hundred, uh, but we we don't have those anymore. And this just shows that in the Midwest we are unique from other regions in in the fact that our climate has been changed um, more or in different ways than a lot of other parts of the country. Next slide. So if we look at, let's look closer to home. This is ice duration in Lake Mendota. It's been one of the climate indicators that's been important for us to look at. And this record goes back to the uh, 1850s. So very good record of how long the ice has been uh, in place on, on Lake Mendota. And you see that um, that that uh, uh, has gone down from on the order of 120 days a year down to about 80. So we've lost 30% of the ice period. Uh, so, and, and we know we can extend this out and it's not only Lake Mendota, I looked at uh, Lake Monona, is it? And uh, Wingra. Same thing. Uh, this is complement. It's of the of the Wisconsin State Climatology Office. A wonderful site that gives you a lot of this kind of data. Next slide. Um, so let's look at precipitation. So this is the annual uh, precipitation, and you see this has changed again from the early 1900s, and you see that the West has dried, and the central part of the U.S. has gotten wetter. And we look at our records, you can see that that's the case in Wisconsin, although there's a portion of northern Wisconsin, which really hasn't uh, gone up too much in terms of uh, its annual precipitation. But in Ames, uh, I think we've gone up about 10%. And it's there's some aspects of that that are very subtle. It's in the spring, early spring, uh, the April, May, June period is the period where we have we have a lot more precipitation. That's a problem for our agriculture. That's when planting takes place. Can't get it planted, you won't harvest anything. So that's critically important. And we know why that's happening. And we know that it's going to continue. Uh, but if we look at seasonally, you can see that uh, there are seasonal differences. This is winter. This is summer. So you can see there's a region here in northern Wisconsin that is actually, uh, the, the, the precipitation has declined in summer. Uh, in winter, it seems to be, uh, have this uh, mixed pattern. In spring, here again, here's, uh, especially in Iowa, but and somewhat in Wisconsin, you'll see there's been an increase and fall has been uh, sort of a mixed, uh, sort of a uh, flipped uh, spatial distribution. Next slide. Uh, so, oh, here we're back to, okay, so this shows Madison's precipitation. Going back to 1870 and the good, good record, you can see that there was a, a period here of, of high precipitation in the late 18th, uh, 19th century, and then it was more or less uh, 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 level, but with high interannual variability. But you can see here across the state, state uh, excuse me, in Madison, this is uh, from the airport. This is from the downtown location when that was active in the early, in the 1800s. But you see again, this, this increase in precipitation and that's going to be the reason that the temperature hasn't gone up in the summer because if you have more water on the landscape 
you have more water in the soil, your plants are doing well, they're flourishing, they are evaporating water into the atmosphere, those uh, factors then tend to cool so that uh, on a wet surface, uh, the, the first issue of solar radiation in the, in the day is to evaporate water, and then it heats the air. So if it's busy evaporating water, it doesn't have as much energy left to heat the air. So the, these uh, hot days are missing then in our climate record. Next slide. Shows my, my uh, changes. Another way we can look at at impact of weather is by the billion dollar weather disasters that occurred. And, and NOAA has done a really nice job of putting those together. And I looked at what Wisconsin, what are the big drivers to climate disasters in Wisconsin? We look at severe storms is the most important, flooding is second, and drought is third. So those are the, the three factors that in the past 40 years have led to uh, major climate disasters in the state. Not all of these are caused by climate change, but that's one of the tasks that we look at. For instance, Ian now, uh, Hurricane Ian, we're looking at, I'm not, but other people are looking at uh, how much of this might be due to climate change and why, and how do we know that? And Ian, it's a good example. We know that most of the reason for that, and you've seen this on the public uh, television, that it is the warm Gulf of Mexico temperatures and the fact that this warming goes deep into the Gulf of Mexico. So the hurricane, the pre-existing tropical cyclone moves in and it's, whoa, look at all this heat here at the surface. So it starts drawing that heat and it'll go from a category one to a category three overnight, overnight. That's unprecedented that it should happen that quickly. So we know where that heat is coming from, we know that it's, it's, it's not the usual. We know the, the record of heat in the Gulf is. So we can ascribe a certain amount of that. And it probably wouldn't have gone to a, slight, a category four or high category three uh, had it not been for all that uh, extra heat in the Gulf of Mexico. That's important for us. We don't have time to look at this, but that also is a driver. Uh, this warm Gulf of Mexico is a summertime, early spring and summer, uh, summer driver of, of uh, extra moisture in the Midwest, here in, here in Wisconsin as well. Next slide. So let's see, ABCC. So uh, this is a complicated slide. I, I won't get into uh, too much detail, but when we look into the future, the big unknown of the future is how are humans gonna behave? How are we going to, how much more carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, are we going to put into the Earth's atmosphere? If it's a lot, if we're on the business as usual uh, trajectory as we are right now, we know that that's, the, that's SP, SSP5. So when you see that, that's we continue to develop fossil fuels, life is good, we'll just continue. We'll give everybody uh, uh, 400 horsepower cars and whatever. Uh, to the other side of things are we adopt a sustainability future. That is, we look for ways to reduce our carbon footprint, to uh, manage our resources, look at our water more carefully. Uh, so these are the two extremes. And then there are others, middle, middle of the road kinds of uh, scenarios that we can, once we get emissions of these greenhouse gases, climate scientists can then plug this into our models, which we've tested on the past. We know they capture the physical uh, consequences and, and we can then project into the future, the temperature, the precipitation, the seasonality, the soil moisture, the heat index. We calculate all of those things and we create then future scenarios. So that's what I'll show you what's uh, in store for us. So these are, the, these are the futures. Again, this is this map of, or this plot of from, this is a short period, 1950 to, the, uh, to 2100. So this projects into the future here. Here's the present. So here's our, uh, this is again the temperature map. So we see compressed now that at, at the end of the 20th century, we saw this rise and the human factor is right here. So if we project this into the future using the laws of physics, not simply statistical and say, well, here we are now, let's just draw a line out here. 
we look hour by hour, our, our models look hour by hour at how the changes in greenhouse gases combined with natural processes lead us to new areas of, of temperature. This is surface, uh, surface temperature. And here's our business as usual scenario. Here's the sustainability. So what we're looking for is to avoid this. We have to avoid this. And I'll show you why. If we don't, uh, we are in, 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 in a lot of danger uh, uh, globally. So if we look at this, this is now, this is average temperature. Again, red uh, is, is a high temperature up to six degrees Celsius. And you see that, first of all, you just look at those this maps and these maps and you see the first thing that jumps out at you, whoa, the Arctic. Bingo, that's in for warming, big time. Uh, there, was, there was an article, something on in the news this morning about, uh, about the worries about the Arctic. It's gonna be ice free and there's gonna be a huge uh, international land grab and resource grab. Uh, in the Arctic, that's one of our challenges now. But so, um, but this is uh, 2040 to 2060. So this is the next um, about mid-century that you see that the Arctic will warm uh, more than the rest. And we'll zoom in and look at some of these at Wisconsin in more detail. But you see that if we get this high SSP 7.0. Uh, that's the, the high emission scenario that um, our, our temperatures here are going to be up by a couple of degrees. That doesn't sound like much, but when you look at its impact on heat waves, the number and intensity of heat waves, then it's, it's a very sobering uh, consequence. Next slide. Uh, so we'll look here at the at the high emission scenario, this is this is precipitation. We looked at temperature. Let's look at precipitation. This is is uh, looking at end of century here. So green is uh, darker the green, the more precipitation. So the thing that jumps out at you first is that much more precipitation at high latitudes. We're looking just at the Northern hemisphere now. And as you go down in, in latitude, the, the changes are, are less and you go more toward in the summertime, you go toward drought. Uh, so droughts will increase. Uh, you know, I've, I've circled approximately where, where Wisconsin is, and you see that in wintertime, much higher precipitation, spring higher, uh, summer could be more drought periods, and in the fall, kind of a mixed bag. Now, one of the things about all these, uh, the stippling is that there is, um, it means that we have less confidence in our models. And these, this is a combination of about 30 different global models run by different countries uh, to, to, and they get together and they compare all their results. They take averages. And when they find that the models disagree, we make these hatched areas here, which say, which is science saying to policymakers, be cautious about using these results, these particular results. You didn't see that stippling on the temperature. A key factor, we are much more confident in our simulations of future temperatures than we are of future precipitation. That's the takeaway message here. But we do see that there are increases of 10 to 30% in precipitation. That could be a lot. And furthermore, it's a, the increases are mostly on the extreme ends. And we're confident in that, that it's the one inch or more precipitation events that are going to increase. Next slide. And I think I'll show that maybe next slide. Oh, this is hot and cold day. So um, we find that um, uh, uh, we, we're gonna be getting uh, more days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the future and fewer days with temperatures uh, below freezing. So that will have impacts on our freeze thaw cycles. So our DOTs are concerned about that. The pothole issue uh, is gonna be exacerbated by, by more warming. Uh, you can see that 30, 20 to 30 days more uh, days, uh, or fewer days above 32 degrees and 20 to 30 more days in Wisconsin with temperatures above 90. No, I, I don't. I didn't look at the number of days. I didn't analyze the last 120 years to see, 
but I think that you probably have on the order of 10 days a year or so, above 90, be typical maybe. Let's look at the next slide. We'll show what it looks like now in, in, uh, as we move forward. Uh, first of all, uh, we should show that when we compare the Midwest with the other regions, we find that um, the change in the warmest five-day heat waves is going to go up by 13 degrees. So if we, if we have a, a, a day of 95 every day, or a week of 95 for every day for five years, for five days, uh, that, that uh, value is likely to go up in the future by 13 degrees. So that'll put you over 100 well over a hundred uh, in a five day period then once in uh, one in a 10 years. So once per decade, you'll get you know, these extreme uh, heat events. The um, coldest day, they also rise. So you're gonna get fewer, or the, the cold events are going to be much, much warmer than they were in the past. Next slide. So uh, frost-free season, we've got a longer, frost-free season. That's good for agriculture. It's good for gardeners. Uh, you have a, a longer period then for your, for your crops or vegetables or whatever. Uh, and that's part of a, a, a general trend. Uh, if we look at uh, in the future, this is uh, high emission. So this is mid-century, again, under the high emission scenario. Uh, you'll gain another 20 days in growing season here by mid-century. So that's maybe good. It's not good for uh, some things, of course. It's it's, uh, and unfortunately, it may be good for um, uh, certain things like poison ivy. Poison ivy gets much more uh, toxic under a higher CO two climate, uh, and there there are other uh, species changes that uh, some that are already vulnerable are going to be uh, negatively impact. Impacted. By the way, what what is it, what is our timing here? I'm trying to keep track. Okay, well, okay, we'll we'll be able to finish up here, well before that. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so here let's let's look at the maximum temperature. This is the change in the number of days above 35 degrees Celsius. That's 95. 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is by mid-century. So we can see, and I'll zero in on this so we can look at Wisconsin. We see how many more days can we expect above 95 degrees here in Madison per year. And this is, this is mid-century, and this is end of century. And you can see that uh, red is, is an increase. So you can see that, uh, and look at the numbers here. 200 days per year above 95. Well, you look at some of the regions of the planet by end of century, you can see that we've got some, we've got some very, very populous regions. What's another characteristic of these regions? Poor. Were they responsible for all of this? No. Talk about inequality. Let's next slide. Okay, so let's look at uh, let's look at Madison. Let's look at Wisconsin. Uh, we're going to see here that I blew this up and I interpreted these colors so you can see it more clearly. Uh, it's five to fifteen more days per year with temperatures above ninety five. That's that's what this this shade. You look at that uh, five to fifteen. So we're we're in this region. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Uh, let's look at, this is end of century, high emission scenario. So uh, end of the 21st century, 30 to 60 more days. And remember, we're confident. We're confident in these temperature projections because the laws of physics are very clear. We've known about greenhouse gases for, for 150 years. We've known that the temperature of the planet would rise by a couple of degrees with, uh, uh, you know, with a, just a 30% rise in greenhouse gases or so. So we're, we're pretty confident that unless we do something, we can look forward to um, a month, a year or so of above 95. 
maximum daily temperature. Uh, you may uh, be familiar with the feels like temperature that's often used in the public television now. So the heat index that looks at what how high can can it go and still uh, and uh, or what what are the consequences of, of high these high temperatures now that's a, a heat index is a combination of temperature here and relative humidity so when it's humid we feel more uncomfortable right and the body just cannot get rid of the heat as fast so it has high impacts then on on the heart, sunstroke, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, those factors are likely in this range here that I've, I've, I've drawn here. So those are temperatures that we really want to avoid or heat indexes that we really want to avoid. Next slide shows uh, an example that if we take a, a degree, a hundred degree day, you know, you get one of those maybe once a decade or so here, uh, and if you add, if it's 35% humidity, the heat feels like index is 107. So it, it raises that feels like temperature by seven degrees. You go up and, and, and you know, people talk, oh, it's 95 degrees and 95% relative humidity. Doesn't happen, never happens. You can't get that much water vapor into the atmosphere. Those of you that technically, you know that the quasi clapeyron equation says the uh, saturation vapor pressure increases exponentially with temperature. So that means the atmosphere holds a lot more water when the temperature gets up in, uh, up in this range. So you, it just cannot evaporate that much water into the atmosphere. Uh, so 107, we want to avoid that kind of thing. Let's look at heat index. What's our future in heat index? We look globally and we look at, uh, here, this is simulated for a heat index of 41, that's 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and so what happens? Oh, okay, the, the big impact here is again, in the tropics, low income, uh, didn't, didn't cause the problem. You see that we have this region in the Eastern US because of the fact of our connection to the Gulf of Mexico, pumping all that water in, in the warm season, in what we, uh, we these, these special storms, we call them mesoscale convective complexes, pump this water up in here, and that's what leads to that difference. So we actually have higher heat indexes than they do in Arizona or in uh, um, Nevada, Utah. It gets hot there, but they don't have that moisture that leads to that extra measure of uncomfortable be, uh, conditions. Next slide. Let's look at Madison. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is mid-century uh, heat index of 106, uh, probably one to five days more per year. Now you probably don't get any right now, so you can look forward to about a week or so maybe of a heat index above 106. So those are conditions that people in our demographic, you just can't be outside for very long. Next slide. Uh, at the end of century, we see it, it doesn't get any better, 30 to 15. So two to four weeks per year, may not be consecutive, but occurrences of heat index above 106, if we don't do anything. Next slide. Okay, so I then draw attention here to the this is this is really this is really critical. And when you have that many days, three months, two to three months of temperature heat index above 106, that means that uh, you, you know there's going to be first of all there's going to be mass migration. First, uh, anybody that can find a way to move is going to move or suffer the consequences if they don't. Uh, so this is, a, this is a global problem. This is our problem, even though that, uh, you know, ours is not going to be increasing nearly as much as others, but th this, we think we have immigration problems now. Um, we have to be mindful of the future. Next slide. So what can we do? Well, I pointed to the greenhouse gases. Those are the bad actors in our 
in our climate system that we've put there. And so what can we do? Well, first of all, we want to avoid these, these high temperatures here. We, uh, uh, at a conference I was at in, in uh, Copenhagen, and uh, it's been about 10 years ago now, they set the guardrail, what they call the guardrail, the temperature beyond which we don't want to go global on its global average to avoid the, the irreversible consequences to the natural systems. Some things, if you start a process in motion, some of those already started, loss of ice on Greenland. We can never recover that in the next thousand years because of the, what we call the, the feedback effects that something gets in motion, you just can't stop it. Uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, as I mentioned, it's the Arctic regions that are impacted the most. And so we're already seeing it big time. These were forecast 40 years ago. And it's now, we're really now starting to see it. So what we want to do is we want to uh, adopt a sustainability future. So let's see what we can do on that. Next slide. So what can I do? What can you and I do? Well, uh, first of all, reduce our basic energy use. Transportation is one of the biggest factors. Uh, any internal combustion engine, we need to try to look for uh, to electrify the transportation system, our heating and cooling systems. Uh, can, we, can we capture and store uh, renewable energy in the form of wind and solar for later use? So we need bat better battery technology. We need better uh, uh, solar energy technology, wind technology. By the way, we have made enormous advances because of good investments of the federal government into the Department of Energy. We have improved the efficiency of wind turbines. You could, if you wanted to go out and buy a one megawatt wind turbine, if you had a $5 million lying around, you could buy one, but you can, you pay 30% less for that than you would have 10 years ago. The price has gone down. What has gone down in uh, price that we buy every day? Well, actually some, we get a 60% of our energy in Iowa now from wind, electrical energy. It can be done. It can be done, 60%. Our, 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 our rates haven't gone up very much. So, you know, this uh, mantra that renewable energy is gonna be more costly. No, solar energy also is now going through its, um, its, its uh, uh, increase in efficiency. And so we're gonna see very large uh, um, outlays of, of, of solar farms, I don't know if Madison has a community wind farm yet, but Ames does. Some cities are adopting that. So instead of putting it on your rooftop, you can just invest in the community. Just invest the equivalent amount, let the, somebody else take care of and maintain it. You get a credit on your, on your, on your bill and, and uh, we get off of fossil fuels. So let's look for that. Let's evaluate and reduce our recreational energy use. Do we have to buy, uh, big vehicles that run around the deserts churning up dust and, and so we can drive fast and bounce around. Can we find, can we appreciate nature more? Take a hike, get a walking trail. I know you've got walking trails and biking trails in this city and oh, halfway to Dubuque, I think. Uh, I, I see them along the road. Uh, so let's make use of, let's rethink, let's recycle, reuse. A refurbish, you know, can we fix something rather than throw it away? Uh, make good choices, vote for candidates that re pr promote renewable energy, uh, invest in companies. I don't know if some of us are in a position now, we're looking at some investments in these environment, society and governance um, metrics that are used to evaluate companies' uh, social responsibility. There's an index for it. It's been around for a long time. Used to be that you invest in those, you pay a price, they weren't very profitable. Now it's become so popular that these are more, they get a better economic return if you, if you uh, insist on at least part of your portfolio is, is uh, paying attention to these ESG guidelines. So that's something you can do without having to change a light bulb. 
changing light bulbs is a good idea if you haven't but that approved, uh, you know it's cheap to do and it makes sense um invest in companies eat less meat i get in trouble i come from iowa we have more hogs than people way more hogs than people three times as many hogs as people in the state we have more laying hens so i get pushback uh but it's a fact that if we get our protein someplace else from plants uh we can uh reduce our our carbon footprint buying local we don't have to have chickens raised in iowa sent to to the east coast to be processed and then shipped back to iowa again to eat we don't need that we can do better uh and uh, the inflation reduction act which is just um, starting to get uh, put in place now has some great opportunities for homeowners and people who are looking at their replacement vehicle electric vehicles hybrid vehicles um, there's 4,000 or 30 percent rebate on an electric vehicle and it's it also applies to used ones now this is new in the inflation reduction act so look for that we've always had things like uh, heat pumps and and uh, weatherization uh, programs run through our state and through your utilities uh, sometimes they'll give you a rebate but if you uh, replace your appliances if your refrigerator is 20 years old you can replace it. it'll be much more energy efficient well they're giving you a rebate to do that now and it's a lot more generous it can be up to 14,000 per homeowner if you add up you know windows and and appliances and and maybe a heat pump for for uh, a water heater or a, a whole house heat pump you can get an eight thousand dollar rebate for participating in that so the programs are there what is our will what is our public will our personal will to to tackle this problem and as i showed from immigration and and unrest that uh, could be generated by the consequences of not doing this it's in our own best interests and what about our children what about our grandchildren what are they going to face what opportunities are they not going to have available i just read an article this past week um, written by a, a woman from the university of michigan she and i have co-authored a couple of papers on this was on migration to the great lakes cities she's looking at her students are uh, looking at california the west wildfires even up into oregon and washington you look at the southwest water issues uh heat you look at the gulf coast humidity mold kudzu uh, you look at florida ian we've now looked really hard at florida you look at the east coast sea level rise people are being uh having a lot of constraints on where they live what about the midwest we look at the great lakes the great cities in the in the midwest these have abundant abundant resources soils temperatures water we have more water than any place on the planet with the great lakes and you can better believe that there are going to be legislation proposed to pipe that west or pipe it out of the midwest and if you've read the great water wars of lake michigan or of the great lakes uh, you'll you'll know that fortunately we've had people go before us who have anticipated that fortunately there was somebody in the 50s who proposed piping water clear to california and um, it was put, they put the kibosh on it they started the great lakes pact but be prepared to fight for your water locally but there are things we can do and we should be doing so for that i'll uh, open it up for some questions or comments or i'll fend off some rotten tomatoes or whatever i need to do here <laughs> and please wait for a mic before asking your question thank you Thank you very much. Uh, I know of several people from the university who go down to the Antarctic 
for various kinds of research. So I don't think I heard you mention the role that the Antarctic does, might, or will play. Yes, uh, very important. There was just an article, I think it was in this morning's news feed about the giant lakes that are forming in Antarctica now, meltwater. Uh, and uh, Antarctica, if we, if the, and again, it's the, the loss of ice is accelerating far beyond what our models had predicted in Antarctica. And there's, there are sections of Antarctica that where the ice is cantilevered out over the water. It's not pinned way out here. It's pinned back here. So it's just hanging out in the water. And the question is, what happens if that pinning point gets eroded away by the ocean circulation, the warming ocean circulation below that. If that West Antarctic sheet collapses into the ocean, it's not projected to for, for centuries, but nevertheless, there are smaller equivalencies that are happening. That West Antarctic sheet would raise sea level by at least 20 feet globally. So if you do the math and look at the maps that would inundate the southern third of Florida, southern third of Florida, that would put the Washington Monument on an island. Most of Washington DC would be underwater. Uh, enormous, enormous consequences. So we're just starting to learn more about Antarctica and what the consequences are. Uh, we're understanding that now on the global scale, no place is immune and, and that there are this insidious impact of our uh, greenhouse gas increases is just pervasive everywhere. I can't cite a lot more things about it. I'm not an expert on that, but I do know enough to know that it's a very big concern by people like the locals here who are, are studying that. Again, ahead of the game in knowing what to look for that the, that the planet's gonna need here, right here in Madison. I've been studying this um, a lot over the past year. Oh, great. Yeah. So I'm a retired um, energy program engineer. Like, but, okay. Uh, so yeah. Antarctica is very scary what's happening right now. Um, back in January, we had one of the biggest warming events ever. It was 70 degrees warmer in the Arctic. And what caused that was, um, they call it an atmospheric river, which, yeah. So yep. what's Mike, happening is your mouth, please. the polar jet Hold stream, it, Mike. Oh, the polar jet streams are weakening because of yep. all the global warming. Right. Yeah. And then we have these natural atmospheric rivers that um, you know from the warming in the tropical areas that um, occasionally it pushes up to the polar regions. Yep. So we had one of those events that pushed up and it busted through. the The normal jet stream was weak, and uh, then there's a paper that I read that. Um, makes it very scary what happened. The, um, the more, the warm water, more warm atmosphere that um, pushed up there, reached a certain temperature where the water froze quickly and fragmented and is shattered in an explosion through all the clouds. And then they call it a chain reaction. And then it cleared the clouds. So now we have clear skies when it should be cloudy in the Arctic. Yeah. And that water, then um, there was rain that went on to the, uh, the glacier. And as that happens, just like in, here in, in the lakes, when you have a, a, a quick warming, the ice will shatter. So this um, place, the, the, the glacier, they thought that would um, take forever to melt, suddenly shattered and it's falling into the sea. The ice shelves are shattering and it's all happening in a chain reaction that's um, accelerating way quicker than they ever believed. So it's, it's very scary what's happening that uh, you can see the Arctic, um, the Antarctic region melt a lot faster. Yeah. And, and, and it, exp it, it really emphasizes too the fact that, and these are things that are on smaller scales that are not, not predicted by our climate models, which are on more coarse scale. So it's just now that we are, f are finding out some of these additional consequences that are happening that we haven't previously been able to model. Have you seen anything else that I showed that should be corrected or do you, do you see any? I mean, I, I want to make sure that I'm agreeing with the, the experts here. And... I'm not, I'm actually, I'm studying a lot, but um, so 
Well, you you've been doing obviously some very careful reading. <laughs> oh, just yeah, just if. All right. So what I am particularly studying is I see have a pretty um, general climate model of what is going to happen, but it it doesn't address what I call the the deep threat, which is. Um, the very disruptive things that can happen and that's volcanic eruptions. Mm -hmm. So I've been studying that a lot and and um, I think that's going to be a big threat in the future as the ice melts as um, volcanoes can that are ice covered can erupt within three decades. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a delayed reaction that happened even back when um, the um, the little ice age ended. There could be like a five, six hundred year delay where there's clusters of volcanoes, and mm -hmm. that will cause a disruption to this whole thing. So it'll be a, a roller coaster of okay. climate events. Any other questions here? Yeah, these are really good comments, and you know, we don't just. This, don't is, know. this is rather a humble question. Um, with the melting in the Arctic and the northern regions, I think that that releases carbon that Nothing. has been held in the, the right. frozen areas? Right. Yes, uh, it releases methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And uh, so that's what we call a positive feedback, positive, not in, the, not in a good sense, but in a fact that it reinforces itself. So you release more methane, more greenhouse gases, more melting of ice, more release of methane. So it's, it just, spins up the cycle and that's been a worry for a long time and all through the arctic not only the arctic ocean but all the boreal forests and and so on the melting accelerated melting is releasing more methane yeah yeah first of all i want to thank you for coming today it's an important subject uh i'm a member of the care for creation committee mm -hmm. in our church here mm -hmm. uh some other factors i think it would be helpful for you to present you know, what's the effect of population growth? I mean, popul our population growth is going crazy. Mm -hmm. The other big factor is the deforestation in the Amazon and mm -hmm. rainforest. Mm -hmm. uh, nature has a way of taking carbon out of the air for the, the plant life and the oceans. And also, have you studied uh, what's changes in the oceans mm -hmm. as far as the... Uh, the carbon, the acidity in the oceans yep. and yep. the- uh, Yeah, there's all those that are known. Yes, I can't address all of those. All right, somebody raise the flag when we need to terminate here. Uh, five minutes? Oh, good, okay. So population, yes. The problem is too many people and too much uh, consumption per person. So we can work on both sides of that. Uh, do something, whatever is, is humane on the population side, but also, we can all do the reduction in resources per person. So um, there are two, two sides of that, and that gets into a lot of controversy. Uh, with regard to the Amazon, yes, and plants, uh, we think, yes, uh, plants and the, the, the early deny, climate deniers were saying, well, plants love carbon dioxide. It's good for us. We put more CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, it's not the case because each of us individually put in about 30 tons per year. So you think about a tree that you plant last year, and it's this big around, and it's on one year, it's grown, what, a, two millimeters in diameter. How much wood is that? Maybe a, a, a pound of wood or, a, you know, so now I've got to clean up after myself. So I have to clean up 30 tons in one every year. Well, so I got one pound here. So I have to plant what? Then uh, 30,000 more trees. So the magnitude of the problem has to be quantified in our minds. See, this is, we've got to do something other than just plant trees. Plant trees are important, uh, but, but it's, uh, and then we're going the wrong way, like you say, with deforestation. So, um, so that's um, an issue. We could spend a whole, whole session on that. Let's see, what was the third one that you had? Um, of the ocean. Ocean circulation, yes, yes. I mentioned the undercutting of the of the cantilevered ice masses, but also the oceans are what move heat around, and they move heat that uh, comes preferentially in the tropical areas, and it moves it toward the polar areas. 
So if we mess at all with the ocean circulation, we're messing with that circulation of moving heat northward. An example was in, in the, um, um, we have evidence that sometime in the past, the Gulf Stream, which comes around the Caribbean up along the east coast of the US and then shoots now up to Norway, keeps Europe much warmer than it ought to be given its latitude, right? I mean, Denmark is about the same latitude as Hudson Bay, but Denmark, except for some fogginess, is a pretty interesting and comfortable place to live. In the, during this period when the, uh, and it was thought to be a, a, a massive water outflow from the Arctic region, the Gulf Stream was pointed toward Portugal. And so instead of hitting Scandinavia, it was aimed at Portugal. Temperatures in Northern Europe dropped by eight or 10 degrees Celsius, just because of that change in the ocean circulation. Antarctica is, is, a, is a source of deep water formation. So water comes in and it cools and it goes clear to the bottom of the ocean. And so that's one of the drivers of the ocean conveyor belt, so to speak. The other one is in the Arctic region. So those two uh, lead to the ocean circulation. We know a lot about that, not as much we should, but, and the El Nino, La Nina, I mentioned that. Go ahead, Meg. Yeah. I just wanted to also express my appreciation for this presentation. Oh. Uh -huh. um, and just a reflection too. I feel overwhelmed about this all the time. And I think probably a lot of us feel more overwhelmed now from having this very clear explanation of what uh, we can expect. I've done it again. <laughs> no, I want to say that this is actually part of what we need to do is talk about it. And we all uh, heard a lot of things that are real and happening where we live. And I think that's a big part of what we need to do is talk about it. Exactly. Because it's exactly. very clear exactly. that we're not heading in a good direction. Yeah, right. But we're not talking about it all the time no. with a lot of people. So I think I'm really glad that we're having this conversation yeah. today. And let's keep talking about it and sharing this with people. I think that's a big part of what where we can make a difference. And it's through talking about it in these conversations that we can normalize normalize into our lives some of this thinking about walking instead of driving, of biking, of use of resources, of enjoying nature and avoiding high carbon recreation, uh, things that aren't critical to our sustaining life. I think we're getting close time. I think one yeah. more question and then... Uh, I just have a comment to tag oh. on to what she just uh -huh. said, and that is... Um, the importance of education and starting Absolutely. really young. Um, last night I saw on PBS a nature show about a mother polar bear and her two cubs. And it just was heart wrenching because, you know, obviously they're suffering yeah. because um, anyway. Um, so I think programs like that should be shown yeah. to element elementary children right. and turn our kids into little Greta Thunbergs because, <laughs> you know, right. we need we need them to be right. aware and inspired and interested. For sure, for sure. Uh, let's uh, give thanks to, to Dr. Tackley. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if you come back next, if you come back next week, Pastor Katie's going to provide a reflection on her sabbatical from this summer, and I'm really looking forward to hearing that. So hope to see you then. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, I appreciate your comments there. Sure. That's great. I, uh, 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 um.